one of my clients, when he made a trade, all of a sudden he would just go into a panic. Turns out it was the same visceral panic as when his father came home drunk late at night. He would hide under the bed for fear of getting screamed at or beaten. So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I'm joined by Richard Friesen, who is the author of a book called A Private Conversation with Money. And I've just been talking to Richard, who's based over in the US in Silicon Valley, um, about his, his past and his history. And it's a, it's a fascinating story, so I can't wait for us to share his story and some other things that he's actually done. Welcome to the show. Oh, it's so good to be here. I've listened to a couple of your uh, podcasts, and I just love the way you uh, develop conversations and let it flow. So I'm really excited to see what we're going to discover. And by the way, pushback or disagreement sometimes creates uh, some interesting things. So feel free to uh, get aggressive if you want. Okay. I'm not sure it's my natural nature, but I'll give it a go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I like having the permission to do that at least. So you've just been sharing a little bit of your story with me. I'd love for you to share it with the listeners because it hasn't all been highs, right? We've had a little bit of a few challenges along the way, shall we say. And where you are now is not where you started either. So really keen to hear that. Yeah. So I think that the real awareness that woke me up was in 1995. I had left a, a trading firm and with all the capital and everything, and I'd been on my own. And I started the first year, I made $125,000. Second year, I made 150, 175, 200, and 200 again. And it was April of 90, 1995. I was awakened in the middle of the night by a voice. And it said, Rich, you're only worth 200,000 a year. <laughs> I woke up, looked around, you know, there was nobody else in the room. My wife was still sleeping peacefully beside me. And I got up dressed and I went to the floor of the Pacific Exchange where I was the independent market maker. I was on my own. I got there so early, the doors were still locked. I sat on the concrete steps between those huge, uh, you know, massive pillars. And I thought about my life and I thought about that voice and what it said to me. And I realized now with hindsight, as I work with entrepreneurs, traders, uh, professional money managers, that we all have these voices and these internal conflicts that we have. So when the doors open, I did what I normally do. I stood at the back of the trading pit. For those of you not familiar with trading pits, is you don't own a spot. It's usually the best spots are held by the toughest, the meanest, the most well capitalized, the guy on the social hierarchy. And I always stood at the back as Rich Friesen, you know, he's a philosophy major, psychology, he's, he's not really aggressive. <laughs> but I decided from that voice that I it no longer suited me. So I stood right in the best spot in the front between the two busy brokers and the book staff. So I stood in that spot. The other market makers came in. The guy who always stood there, stood beside me, watching the clock, tapped me on the shoulder before the bell went off. I didn't move. So there was a pushing match back and forth. <laughs> and we were warned a $10,000 fine if we got into a fight. The rest of the pit went, ooh, ooh, what's going on here? And I stood there. And when the bell went off, and I don't know if you've ever seen movies of trading pits, but I'm going to move back from the microphone. I went... I'll buy 50, sell you 100, buy 20, sold, buy them. It was the pit thought I had gone crazy. But what actually happened was a mindset shift that said, I am done with my own internal limitations. I went on to build a trading firm and about a third of the traders just took off. We had a system, a method, it worked well. A third of them did okay but a third of them didn't seem to make money. And I thought, what if, just what if these traders had the same internal limitations or different limitations than I had? I brought in a hypnotherapist and we discovered a whole number of things. We can go into them if there's time. But what we decided, the discovered was they had their internal limitations and their own messages and their own internal net worth. So, then that has led me to where I am now to writing my book, A Private Conversation with Money, to invite people to rapport with money, meaning, and success. Okay. So we've gone from running, you know, a successful trading firm, 
um, with eight traders. You work with them all, obviously, to change their own mm-hmm. mindset. Um, I'd love to hear what, what are the common things that you found out in terms of what creates this self-limiting belief around money for us? Oh, my gosh. Right now, we have cultural beliefs. I, in the U.S., you know, we have a very divided culture that around politics, economics, money, wealth. And if we internalize both sides of that, we end up internalizing, internalizing this conflict. And as a result, we tie up our energy and our vision and our message and our methods so that we're constantly criticizing ourselves. We have, from growing up, we have beliefs that, you know, money doesn't grow on trees or wealthy people are evil or, oh, if you have it, you spend it or money is energy. We just keep it flowing. So we have all these different beliefs. Some of them are helpful, some of them not so much. So by becoming aware of them, you know, for example, with my traders, like one of them grew up uh, dirt poor in West Virginia, which is a, a, a poor place in the U.S. And uh, large families, cousins, uncles, aunts, you know, the whole extended family around this culture of poverty. And when he started to make money, he realized that he would be excommunicated from his family. So how did he solve it? Yeah. Just not make money. Another trader uh, had a younger brother who was severely handicapped physically and needed a lot of medical care and stuff. And he had always been jealous of his brother because his younger brother got all the attention, of course. So he knew if he made money, his mom would come for him to get money to take care of his little brother. And his resentment was so deep. How did he solve it? Not make money. (laughs) And there were other examples of that. So by bringing those things into awareness, then we can decide. Now, I had the, the voice in the middle of the night that was accidental. So my mission now has been, how do we create a process that takes it from an accidental voice to a very deliberate process where people can examine, become aware of, and make a decision from a higher level about how they want to relate to money, meaning, and success. That's interesting. I know that over here in New Zealand, we actually have um, what we call the tall poppy syndrome. And so even those of us who perhaps have decided we do want to, you know, take it to our highest power and do whatever the best we can do. There are a lot of people who love to kind of chop you down and um, pick on you if you have the the nice mm-hmm. car or the nice house or whatever it might be. So does that exist in the US as well? Yeah, we have uh, a division here. Uh, and the division is around what where meaning comes from. And if in fact you say, I am an individual, I am going to create value for others, and I am going to make money from that value. This one point of view, another point of view is there's a one pie model. There's only so much money to go around. If you have more, somebody else has less. So those are you know, at the foundation, two very different approaches to how we live our economic life. So one of the concepts in my book and a reframe is that we rename money certificates of appreciation. So Deborah, you give me a service that I appreciate. I give you a certificate of appreciation. I, you do a service for me and I give you the certificates. I do a service for you and you give me certificates of appreciation. Now, here's the part that a lot of people, it blows their brains and they go, oh. <laughs> the more certificates of appreciation that I collect, the more value I've delivered to the world. Now, once you reframe it like that, then all of a sudden we can say, oh, how can I deliver more value to the world? Do I need more knowledge, more skills? Do I need to shift beliefs? Do I need new behaviors? Who am I? You you mentioned, I think it was the imposter syndrome. You know, who am I, rich of reason, to be able to deliver value to the world? And once we start looking at it from that and then looking at receiving certificates of appreciation, all of a sudden, all this internal conflict, the cultural, the stuff from our parents, 
from our peers, all of a sudden that melts away and we have rapport with money and meaning. Now, I should imagine for some people listening, that all sounds a wee bit scary, right? Because this sounds like going to a counselor is going to kind of unpeel all the layers of an onion and, and get right to the root cause of who you are. And, and that might scare some people. But um, what is the process that you go through to actually help people get to that? And is it scary? It, it is viewed as scary. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that when we look at it from the outside, it's scary. However, my process is to invite them into a mindset that feels better, gets them to their goals, and honors their values. So if we look at it as an invitation to step into something that feels better, then we can actually start to make some progress. So if I have a client and he's struggling with something or she is struggling with something, and then they all of a sudden go, oh, wow, that feels better. Bingo. Then we know we're making progress. So at the start of that process, I have what I call the golden keys. The first is awareness. So I'll do a little example right now. So how am I, right now I notice my stomach's tight. My breathing's a little shallow. Uh, my right arm hurts a bit from stressing it the other day. Uh, my thighs are a little tight. Okay. The next step of the golden keys after awareness is acceptance. Okay, I, do I beat myself up for being a little tense and being a little excited with Deborah being right here, me being on the program? Whoa! <laughs> or do I say, okay, that's normal. And the, the third then is to say, okay, now what do I want? From awareness to acceptance, I now can go to agency. And the agency says, what would I like? I would like to have a wonderful conversation with Deborah while I'm relaxed. I'm breathing easily. So I've just made an example of the shift that I make with the golden keys. It's beautiful. Okay. So it's about, um, so first of all, being aware of what is mm -hmm. actually going on, accepting that it's perfectly mm -hmm. normal and um, not to be scared by it. And then the agency, which is thinking about what do you really want and shifting your um, energy and your behavior, I suppose, to, to focus on what you're doing. Exactly doing. right. You just nailed it. Beautiful. Okay. And so I know that you started this work with the traders on mm -hmm. the floor, but this can apply to absolutely anybody, can't it? I mean, any entrepreneur, they don't have to be a trader. They don't have to be um, in that particular field. Well, the, the value of traders is that you get instant feedback. <laughs> I mean, there's no question. Okay. Whereas if you're practicing yep. to be a dentist or a lawyer or you're with clients, I mean, the feedback loop sometimes can be even years. And sometimes it's so complex, you don't get it. So the value of starting with traders is I have clear steps. And so as a result, we, and the human brain works the same way, you know, whether you're trading or an entrepreneur dealing with uh, business challenges, and so if we can be, develop that awareness, that acceptance, and then ask what we want, we can then even move forward in, in actually, I've had clients who say the work that we've done on trading or on my entrepreneurship has translated to a better relationship to my wife and kids or husband and kids. Okay. So what's the biggest kind of hurdle you come up against when you're working with people to help them to change their mindset about money? The biggest surprise that I had <laughs> that I was not anticipating was being com comfortable with success and wealth. Typically a trader will start to make money. We're working together. They go up, 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 and then all of a sudden they'll go boom and they'll give away, you know, months worth or weeks worth of progress. I've had a client who uh, was building a business to be sold. It was a heating, air conditioning business. And he knew who he, a national firm he wanted to sell it to. He needed, he knew their criteria. And so he worked for se several years building the business for that. They got interested. They were negotiating the sale of the business, his goal, right? And he started nitpicking and he started sabotaging the sale. So we looked at it and it turned out that in a, his subconscious messages are, you weren't worth it. 
you, you're you going to be responsible for a lot of money and you'll probably blow it. Um, you now are going to be in a different social strata because this amount of worth is going to put you out of your current uh, social strata. And so all those things, so we started to sabotage it. But again, we go back to awareness, acceptance, and then what do you want? And so once we got the issues down in terms of what his subconscious fears were and brought them up, then we could deal with them all. And then he could step in and he successfully sold the business. Wow, that's great. So there can be a, a huge element of sabotage. And I suppose actually just thinking about that, it's really true, right? Because if you're going to be lifted up into a different, um, we, we call it a class mm -hmm. system in the UK, we don't have that quite so much over here in New Zealand, but it still exists in some respects. That's really kind of nerve wracking for people, isn't it? Because that's a, a potential change for their entire life and um, they're not sure how to deal with that. So, I mean, apart from the fact that they're going to accept that this is what's going on, how, what else can you do to make yourself feel comfortable with well, what you're pointing out is so important, and I'm so glad you brought it up, is we're clan animals. When, you know, our, mm -hmm. when we were evolving on the plains of Africa and you were out, kicked out of the clan or you were by yourself, you died. And so as a result, we have a very deep uh, neurological need to be part of something. And, you, you know, you think of, it used to be, uh, and you can give me some British flavor for it, but it used to be you were in a small town, you had all your extended family there, you knew your role in life, and everything was pretty well just prescribed because you were part of it. And we look at the, uh, you know, families are no longer what they used to be. There's less extended families, less kids. Uh, uh, we can go to one job or another job. Uh, religion in the U.S., you know, participation has dropped significantly. So, you know, what do we belong to? I, I see sports fan. I see these fans, you know, all make up and, and yelling and screaming at the same time. That's a real bonding experience. You're part of something. We all need to be part of it. And if you, on one hand, you have a goal of wealth and success. And on the other hand, you don't recognize how you can still be part of the human race and part of a particular clan or culture, and you don't recognize that, then you do the self-sabotage. So I'm really delighted you brought that up because that is something that we can all look at. And once we're aware of, then we can start to make better decisions. Hmm. No, it's really cool. Because you're right, we're losing a lot of those structures, aren't yeah. we, that we've traditionally had. I mean, I'm originally from the UK. Um, and I grew up in a little village where everybody was very yep. close by, my my family, yep. everybody was a close by, and friends. I actually have friends who never, ever left England. You know, that was their their entire life. I was quite fortunate to kind of travel a lot, but it meant that I haven't necessarily had quite so many of those those formal structures. I think that means that I can adopt to, adapt to change a little bit easier than some other people can, but only because I've had a lot of experience mm -hmm. of it. Okay, so we have to be really clear about you know what we want so we have to make sure that we don't self-sabotage and that we understand why we might do that and therefore um you know put in place some measures that can help us not do that um but i'm, I'm just curious because life hasn't always been sort of a bed of roses for you either i mean you built a very successful trading company and then you started with a software company if i'm right then that software was about you know, electronic trading mm -hmm. so based on the experiences you had on the floor and of course, you then went through what a lot of people went through, which was the dot-com bubble burst. And what what happened to you then and how, how did you deal with that? And what, what effect did that have on your beliefs around money as well? Oh, this is a, a real personal question. And I think that if I go back and look that, you know, I sold my trading firm. I started, I saw the end of the, the floors. I saw everything was going to go to electronic trading. I started a trading firm. The, one of the biggest mistakes I made, and I look back on it, is uh, building something really big. I got VC funding, spent $25 million to build this wonderful uh, wow. generic box for trading almost everything. And I got too far ahead of my customers. I mean, right now, electronic trading, I mean, that's just part of the world. But at that time, Yep. I didn't have a connection to my customers. So now that, you know, there's a process called minimal viable product, MVPs. Mm -hmm. And I realized yep. that 
I have the capability of envisioning a future. And in fact, I've got 10 patents that are now used by almost all trading companies and brokerage firms in the world. And that was because I could envision this future. But the negative of, of being able to vision the future is that it's so easy then to disconnect from current needs, current pain, current desires of your clients. And I did get ahead. And when the dot-com collapse happened, all my customers evaporated and the VCs were not interested in funding us anymore. Wow. Okay. Well, that must have been a bit of a, a bit of a shock. I mean, how did you cope with that? What happened? Yeah, what's that? interesting was I was looking back, especially as a therapist, I, I was depressed, but I'm, it's such a, you know, go get them. Let's okay. We're bouncing. We're going to go, go. It, I was covering it up by trying to have some sort of artificial energy and trying to just make it work and whatever. When the inside, there was something that was really broken because my expectation was my wife's ex expectation was this was it. Okay. So now we could plan the mm -hmm. next stage of our lives for wealth and then look how we can, you know, make our family, the world and, and change our approach to the world rather than providing value through commercially, how can we provide value elsewhere? And when that collapsed mm. and, you know, going back to uh, near zero, then that meant uh, rebuilding. And I don't think I fully recognized the impact. And it took a couple of years before I was willing to come to terms with that. And if I look back, I wished I would have had a mentor who could have helped through that process much sooner. I was going to say, it's one of the things I'm going to ask. I know that I know, um, I've had a couple of, you know, business successes and a couple of pretty horrific mm -hmm. failures as well. And, um, yeah, they do affect you because it's going to knock your confidence. It's going to knock a whole, and as you said, you've planned for this life ahead of you that then suddenly changes. Um, the biggest thing I had was in the first one, I, I don't think I had anybody around me to help me through it or to even help me see what was going on. The second time around, I was fortunate to actually have, um, you know, somebody who was able to call it a wee bit quicker and actually help me through it. And I think sometimes we're really afraid to ask for help because we think that will make us look weak. But in actual fact, people love to help. And also it meant that I got to get through that more easily by having the, that supporting help. So. Yeah, mentors are important, aren't yes. they? <laughs> um, and because we tend to repeat our survival processes. So, you know, so yeah. if we grew up, a, a good hunk of my clients, we can go back to processes that they created when they were five, six, seven. You know, for example, one of my clients, uh, when he made a trade, uh, all of a sudden he would just go into a panic mode. Well, it turns out it was the same visceral panic is when his father came home drunk late at night, he would hide under the bed for fear of getting screamed at or beaten. So, so we created a survival process of hiding and his repeat for trading was, I'm just ignoring this trade that's going against me. <laughs> We're going to hide from it. So we have sur under the bed, it'll be, it'll be yeah. fine. Yeah. <laughs> So we have survival patterns that we repeat over and over again. And I've uh, ferreted out most of these in my life, but still I find they get triggered. And occasionally I'll go back to an old survival pattern, even if it doesn't serve me. But now I hope I'm aware of it much sooner. So uh, that's always helpful. So it comes down to sort of being able to have that awareness because we are all going to get triggered, right. right? As humans, whether we like it or not, um, I'd love to think that I'm perfect, but I get triggered quite regularly. But if you can actually recognize it, be aware of it, then you can do something with it. It's when we're completely oblivious to it that we actually can't well, do anything. And awareness without judgment, yeah. we can say, okay, yeah. oh, I'm aware right now that, you know, I got triggered or I'm really angry or that uh, I made a, a hasty decision. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. I wonder what's going on. That's fascinating. Ah, okay. I can see how that came about. That is so much different. Say, don't you rich freeze and don't you ever do that again. God damn it. Yeah, I'll be you. I mean, that's it. How stupid can you be? How stupid can you be? <laughs> so, you know, that's obviously not helpful. But if we go, oh, that's fascinating. Yep. I did that again. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So, that's the part of acceptance that I think is really important. 
But that's going to be difficult for some people, isn't it, in terms of imagining? Because that inner critic is such a strong voice in our, <laughs> our heads. You know, that's where the imposter syndrome comes from. That's where um, all the time, you know, we, we, we actually, if we ever spoke to other people like we spoke to ourselves, I think we'd be ostracized by the planet. You know, uh, we're really cruel. We're really cruel to ourselves. So how does one overcome that inner critic? How do you actually um, tame, or, or maybe that's not the right word, but how do you actually have that, 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 more meaningful conversation with the inner critic rather than having its sheet streaming at you about how stupid yeah, you are. Yeah, there's a number of exercises. One of them is I have my client take a big jar. I've done this myself. Go to the bank, get a hundred one dollar bills, and every time you hear that voice, boom, you put a buck in. I tell you, that hundred dollars can go really fast, sometimes in a day. <laughs> Another uh, oh, yeah. technique I use, I'll say, may I have a conversation with your inner critic? And I go, huh? What? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you, you have a name for the inner critic? Oh, I don't know. Uh, critic. Okay. Let's call him critic. May I have a conversation with critic? Okay. Well, hello, critic. This is Rich. Uh, Bob's given me permission to talk to you, and I'd like to have a discussion with the understanding that you have a positive intent for Bob. Is that right? And amazingly, that voice will come. Yeah, I have a positive intent for him. What's a positive intent? To keep him moving, to make sure he doesn't make mistakes. He just can't make mistakes. If he does, he's, you know, then the world will think less of him. So we then start to have this conversation. So your job as critic is to improve his life. Is that right? Mm -hmm. How has that worked so far? <laughs> Then the neuro critic will think, oh, uh, not so good. Okay, how would you like to do a better job? And then we talk about different ways he can talk to Bob, different ways that he can use his positive intent. So always going back to the positive intent and then creating better methodology. Love it. Okay. Back to the positive intent. Now, I know that you have got so many things that you can actually share, and I know you've also got an online course as well people can have a look at, but I guess from a, a practical point of view, um, I love to share, you know, three tips or tools that the listeners can actually take away and start putting into place straight away. Would you mind sharing those with sure. us? Sure. I have my smartphone. I set an alarm. Yeah. Or it can be every hour, every five minutes. And then I just notice what is my physiology. So again, right now I notice it. Shoulders a little tight. So I just do what do we call our set score, sensations, emotions, thoughts. I look at my physical sensations. Am I judgmental? Am I critical of myself? Am I feeling bad, good? And then I look at the quality of my thoughts. You know, what what are they? Are they supportive? Are they judgmental? And so I can just do that every hour. So that would be one thing. So the next thing then is, can we come to the point of acceptance? And in terms of business, there's just all sorts of things we just haven't had time to talk about. But how we're delivering value, how does that relate to meaning in our lives? Because if we're just working to have a, a fancier car, a trophy spouse, a bigger house, you know, social standing, eventually the energy it takes and we don't have that inner rapport, it means we're just fighting ourselves and we're going to exhaust ourselves. And that's why I know there's so many studies come out that anxiety, stress, and our internal conflicts are uh, increasing with, you know, with this generation. So, uh, mm. and the other thing is to ask yourself, well. So that's, so you're talking, you're talking about sort of connecting to your kind of deeper purpose. Yes. Because, you know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to have a nice house or a nice car, but um, that shouldn't be the, the motivator as such. It's like, you know, how do yeah. you add value to the world? Yeah. So if I'm yeah, trying to that, fill a hole in my heart and to prove that I'm somebody, that's very different than mm. I've delivered value and now. I can take the money that is a representation of that value and create a wonderful life for myself. So if, uh, you know, people are interested, they can uh, check into the free online course. In fact, you can go to conversations.money slash Debra, D-E-B-R-A. And there's, uh, I'll give your listeners a, a free online course and they can it uh, goes along with a book that they can also get online, a uh, private conversation with money. And of course, I'm always available for people who want a more extensive conversation. 
Yeah, so do you actually work with individuals to actually help them overcome these things? Obviously, you've got your courses and your book, but do you work with individuals in helping them? Yes, overcome? I have a private coaching practice, and we work, and we use different metrics to measure. We use what I call hot seat work, where we, just in present time, it's like right now, I can say, you know, what's my physical sensations? Oh, my stomach's still a little tight. We do that. And we look at their decision process and the mindset that they're in while they're making decisions. If they, if you can just step back for a minute and say, okay, what's my mindset before I'm making this decision? A lot of mistakes can be avoided. Love it. Okay, great. So we've got a number of things there. So I mean, we've talked about the golden mm -hmm. keys, uh, which is obviously really key to sort of becoming aware acceptance of the agency. We've talked about sort of, you know, um, connecting with your personal why. So why why do you actually exist and what are you trying to do? And I think one of the things I like to think about is you, you've got to put the oxygen mask on yourself um, and ensure that you're able to look after yourself before you can really add value to others. And I think sometimes we forget that. Um, but being really clear about the value that you bring and again, changing that, that thing around, you know, rather than it being money and being driven by money, it's certificates of appreciation. So you offer value and I, 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 pay you in, with certificates of appreciation and that's all good. We've talked about um, uh, setting your smartphone up to actually you know, listen in and see how you're feeling mm -hmm. at certain times in the day. And then um, what was the third one that we, we mentioned? I just um, I wrote that down, but I can't read my own writing right now. <laughs> that's terrible. Well, there's so much we could go into. Oh. <clears throat> there is so much, yeah. So, but anyway, so that, yeah. Go ahead. No, but go. I think the for the foundation is a uh, personal awareness and that's where it starts yes mm -hmm. yeah completely agree and so your book conversation a private mm -hmm. conversation with money you can find that obviously through amazon yep. and all the usual mm -hmm. places and what if people want, want to get in contact with you richard if they want to get in contact with you personally sure. how would they get rich on? at mind muscles.com r-i-c-h at mind muscles.com no, that's fantastic. Hey, look, we could probably talk all day. I, I always, I love, you know what I love about being a podcast host yeah. is I get to meet the most amazing people. And I also get to add an extra book to my collection every single time I talk to somebody. So I'm going to go ahead and get that book myself. I think it's going to be really helpful. And I have a big library here that I share with my clients as well. So um, thank you very, very much for being so open and for sharing, you know, not only the good stuff, but the, the challenges you've been through and how you've overcome them. I really appreciate that, that level of vulnerability. Well, Deborah, I appreciate the open-ended conversation, the invitation to just step into a conversation that uh, is shared for, you know, what you've shared and what I've shared together. And I really appreciate your, your uh, professionalism. Well, oh, thank you. That's great. Hey, look, um, as I said, if you go to conversations.money forward slash Deborah Richard is very kindly giving you a free online course that you can actually do, which goes accompanies by the book. Um, you can reach out to Richard himself. Um, and I think this is just, I think this is a really important conversation. I know a lot of people struggle with this. A lot of people struggle with uh, the imposter syndrome, the, the tall poppy syndrome, all these things that are sort of thrown at us in our life. And this is a chance to actually explore that and go, how can I change my, um, the way that I feel about money and what I can do with it. So Richard, thank you for your time. I look forward to keeping you in contact.